Sit right there. This isn't what I expected. Pregnant from an accident? And if I'm honest, I'm not sure if this is what I want. There's so many different options. But they just told me about the one I never really thought of. Could I really be a birth mom? Is adoption something I could go through with? Right now, I don't think I'm ready to raise a kid on my own. But there's so much to consider. And not a lot of time. On one hand, what would my family think? My friends? If I deliver this baby just for adoption, will I feel left alone afterwards? How would it change me? Then, on the other hand, this baby deserves a chance to love, to live, and also to be happy. While I don't think I can provide that, maybe adoption can. And plus, I'll have help. I've been talking with a person from the center. She's been helping me to make a decision that's best for me and my baby. From choosing the right adoption agency, even letting me see potential families who are ready for a child. These families left notes for me about how they want to love my baby, how they honor my decision, and how I'm not alone. The people from the center won't even abandon me. They have support for me during and after my pregnancy. I can even have some involvement in my child's life if I choose to. I'm starting to be convinced this is a choice that I want to make. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having us here. I wanted to show that video to start because that's why I'm here. I'm Stacy Knox. I'm the director of Spirit of Faith Adoptions, and as Pastor Rich had said, yes, I'm new to that position, <laughs> but I am not new to adoption. Uh, God called me to adoption fresh out of college, which was just a few years ago. <laughs> um, but I stand before you today just in awe of what God is doing through the beauty of adoption. We're all adopted into God's family. And then I look at this family over here, a few of them are missing. Craig's wife is missing. She's at a, an adoptive mom retreat in Lancaster, Pennsylvania this weekend. So that's Craig and his daughter Maggie, who they adopted through Spirit of Faith Adoption. So I got to meet Craig and his wife many years ago before that happened. And then there's three others that are in the program and ones at a retreat. But anyway, um, it's incredible to see what God is doing. And the reason I wanted to show you that video is because the person who isn't here is the biological mother who made such a sacrifice uh, to choose life and to choose a family for her daughter Maggie when her daughter was born. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Spirit of Faith. Yes, we, that's our long name. The short name for fun is SOFA. Um, lots of beautiful family connections are made on sofas, so that's part of it. <laughs> but more importantly, it, you know, we, we support families always, so SOFA stands for Support of Families Always. So we met the Hargan Raider family many years ago, but Craig will tell you the whole story of how we are still connected and walk through the whole journey, lifelong journey of adoption with families. These are prayer cards and if you pick one up in the atrium when we're done, um, it means a lot to be praying for everybody who's involved in adoption. Um, I love it because every day I get to see people come together through the love of a child. There is just nothing more special than that. It's powerful, it's beautiful, and it has grown my faith. <laughs> um, God loves us. Deep in our hearts, he planted a desire for us to love and be loved and be accepted and belong and um, welcomed into his forever family. And adoption is a beautiful picture of that. Um, 
I'm excited for you to see uh, God's beautiful plan of adoption in God's word, which we'll take a look at in a minute. And through their testimonies, they're gonna get to speak too. Um, but before that, I wanted to op us, open us up in some prayer and invite God here, just like the song said, to surrender and put everything else at his feet and just watch in awe of what he is doing through adoption. It's amazing. Let us pray. Loving God, shine your light. Make everything I think, say, and do today and every day reflect you and extend your love. Thank you for welcoming us into your kingdom through adoption, and thank you for the blessing of adoption here on earth. Thank you for having a plan and a purpose that includes safeguarding children through adoption. We pray for expectant mothers who are thinking about adoption. We pray for birth parents who have made the courageous decision of adoption, and for the adoptive parents who nurture the children you placed into their arms. Thank you for uniting birth parents and adoptive families through the redemptive love of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that through that powerful love, adopted children get to see how much they are loved by you and by the actions of both sets of parents. As Valentine's Day approaches, we're reminded of your deep, uncondi unconditional love for all of us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just wanted to take a look at um, what the Bible says about God's love and adoption in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 8 in the New Living Translation. All praise to you, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us, who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered, us with, with, showered his kindness with us, on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. That same love that motivated the Father to give his son so that we could be called his children is the same love that motivates a biological parent to make the sacrifice of placing a child with an adoptive family when she's not ready to raise that child. And it's the same love that calls families to parenthood through adoption. As uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says in that picture, and that's not a real family, those are models of course, but I wanted to portray exactly what I get to see. And on, on the one side is the biological mom handing over a child to a family who is open to adoption and to God's calling. And that connection in th that picture, and yes, they're sitting on a sofa, <laughs> um, God's redemptive love is all around that family, those people who are, are becoming one, whether they maintain connection or they don't have contact for a while. God unites them through the love of that child, and that is so very powerful. So when I see Maggie sitting there, it just deeply touches my heart that true, I mean, you can see it right there, love never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. These are outward, selfless, sacrificial actions that I just, I'm, I am in awe of, of the people who do this, and um, it's just absolutely amazing how love brings people together, no matter what the circumstances are. Seeing children thrive in families is at the heart of God. So I want you to see adoption through the eyes of a birth parent like we saw in the video, an adoptee, so that's Maggie when she was a few hours old, 
and her dad. <laughs> and her birth mother um, was so gracious to invite Barb and Craig to the hospital to be with Maggie as soon as possible to start the bonding process. It's just such a courageous thing for her to do. And I know that she even said how grateful she was that they were there and could hold her from day one, minute one. <laughs> um, so 12 years ago, through Spirit of Faith Adoptions, Maggie's birth mother lovingly, I just need to stress that so much, how lovingly she chose the Hargan Raider family for Maggie to grow up in. So I want to show you the next slide. That was her picture. That's Maggie at two and her older brother. <laughs> and they added more kids to that family, so Craig will tell you all about that. Um, and they're just having fun on va Valentine's Day baking some cookies, but that's why a mother chooses adoption, is when she can't give her child, especially a father, a mother and a father and a family and a safe, loving home to grow up in. So Maggie, I'm gonna introduce you along with your dad. Come up and Maggie wants to tell you how she feels about being adopted and then Craig's gonna tell you their family story. Hello, um, my name is Maggie Hargenreiter. Uh, 12 years ago, I was adopted through Spirit of Faith Adoptions by my mom and dad. I've always known that I was adopted because every year on my birthday, my mom would tell me the story of the day I was born. Sometimes it just, it doesn't feel like I'm adopted, it just feels like I'm loved twice. First by my birth mom because she gave me life. My birth mom is brave, courageous, and unselfish. I feel a connection with her because we share the same middle name and because she gave me a pink bear on the day that my parents brought me home from the hospital. Secondly, I feel loved by my mom and dad. My parents, always oh, my parents always tell me that before they adopted me, they felt like someone was missing from their family. I also love my parents because they are there for me at school events, when I need their emotional support, or when I want to go shopping. They have taught me that not only do I have a father here today who loves me, I have a heavenly father who loves me even more. God can work in many ways, especially through adoption. When my parents take me to church, I feel a special connection with God. When I, talk, when I think about adoption, I realize that we are all adopted by God, and that is why we are all here today. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Maggie, for sharing a bit of your story. And let's be honest, she's the real keynote speaker this morning, am I right? <laughs> but thanks to all of you for inviting us to share our adoption story this morning. It's encouraging to find such a pro-adoption church. I know there are many adoptive families uh, and I know Pastor Rich let me know that uh, his family has adopted four. Um, praise God for a church and for church leadership that really sees the importance of this area of ministry. Um, me and my wife, Barb, and I don't know if you can flip to the next slide here. <clears throat> um, this is our family uh, as recently as uh, this past summer. Uh, my wife, Barb, and I have five children. So our oldest is our biological son, Alex. He's 20 years old. Uh, we have four adopted children. Maggie, uh, who you know of, we uh, adopted her privately through uh, Spirit of Faith back in 2010. So she's 12 now. Uh, and we also have James, who's 13, Olivia, <clears throat> 11 and Thomas is 10 and we adopted them as a sibling group um, out of foster care in 2014 uh, my wife Barb <clears throat> excuse me my wife Barb couldn't be here today she's actually in a foster and adoptive mom conference in Pennsylvania so she let me know last night there are over 850 women who are gathering together around this area of ministry. <clears throat> now, 
But the truth is that she's the real <clears throat> driving force in our home around adoption. I consider her to be a strong, brave, relentless advocate for our children and for children in general. Um, she also wears the official title of outreach coordinator with SOFA. Um, but at home, she's just Mama Bear. And uh, if you mess with Mama Bear and her bear cubs, you better watch out, because uh, you don't poke the bear. <clears throat> uh, anyway, she couldn't be here today, uh, so I guess you're stuck with me to share our story, and I hope I can do it as well as she does. As I was reflecting on our adoption story, I realized, as Maggie said, that the key truth is that we've been adopted by God in Christ. I also realized that my family, in some small way, reflects the larger story of God's family. So I'm honored to be able to share with you. Um, the scripture says, and uh, we're actually going to sing the song, I'm No Longer a Slave to Fear. Um, that comes from Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 15. It says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. So really, our intimate relationship with God is only possible because of the fact that we've been adopted through Christ into his family. Going back a little bit in time, uh, in the beginning of our family story, um, Barb and I began our together life back in our early 20s when we both were living in Washington, D.C. Even though we had grown up in State College, Pennsylvania together, um, as kids we really didn't hang out because we were two years apart. And so it wasn't until I started interviewing for jobs in Washington, D.C. that my mom and Barb's oldest sister, who were best friends, decided to play matchmaker. So they paired us up together on a drive to Washington, D.C., where I would be interviewing. Um, I had recently become a Christian at age 20 after being challenged by some friends in college to read the Bible. I decided I'd read the Bible, and after reading the book of John, I was like, where's, where's this truth been all my life? I couldn't believe what I was reading. <clears throat> Um, Barb, in contrast, was raised in a Bible-believing home, and she had received Christ at the age of three. So I think my mom and her sister could see the connection there, and were trying to get us together. Well, it worked. <laughs> uh, eventually, we both got jobs in Washington, D.C., and we started hanging out together, and that really began five years of friendship first, and then eventually dating and then in 1996, we got married. Reflecting back, my most powerful memories from that time period were of us praying together as a young couple, just starting out. And I can tell you 30 years later, God is still answering those prayers. <clears throat> Soon after we married in 96, we decided we would leave Washington, DC. We wanted to start a family. We wanted to be able to afford a home, so we decided to move to North Carolina. And uh, I began a job there in North Carolina in the small town of Winston-Salem. And uh, we bought our first home, and Barb uh, stayed at home at that point in time in hopes of soon becoming a stay-at-home mom. <clears throat> but our struggle with infertility would last over five years. And with the heartbreak of several miscarriages and the infertility, we be eventually began to seek other options. And we started the adoption process. And right as we were about to sign paperwork and start our home study, um, surprise, we found out that Barb was pregnant with our son, 
Alex. <clears throat> Everything seemed perfect. We put our adoption plans on hold and we began to prepare for our soon-to-be family. And then something unexpected happened. The bank that I was working for announced that they were merging and that the corporate headquarters would be moved from Winston-Salem. So I was gonna to have to relocate anyways. Um, and because we were gonna be forced to relocate, Barbara and I started looking for other jobs uh, closer to our families in Pennsylvania. It was Friday, November 2nd, 2001, that I interviewed with a bank in Cleveland. Uh, it was Sunday, November 4th, that I came home uh, and was in church that morning. Our large church in North Carolina, uh, the associate pastor there was Dr. Gary Chapman, the author of the five love languages books. And he preached a sermon that Sunday morning <laughs> entitled, God's Place is Not Our Place. And in his hypothetical example, he said, God may be asking you to move from Winston-Salem to Cleveland. <clears throat> and Barbara and I were stunned. We couldn't believe it, what he was saying. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I had just been interviewing in Cleveland. <laughs> well, Dr. Chapman and Barb talked about it a couple of days later, and they laughed. I think. Gary had been up here for a marriage conference, so Cleveland was on his mind. <clears throat> um, but it was a couple weeks later that I got a job offer, and we began to pack our bags and head for Cleveland. I got to admit, it was a really hard transition. <laughs> right in the middle of her pregnancy, we had to change all our doctors. We had to leave friends. We had to leave our church. And we just kept asking, why, Lord? We didn't understand why we had to move. Well, it was about three years later, on December 6 of 2004, that God began to reveal the why to us. It was a day like any other day when I got a phone call from Barb at work. Our pediatrician was sending her and Alex down to Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. She said, go directly there and pick up your husband on the way. I remember looking down from my office building on Euclid and 9th Street and seeing her red minivan pull up and going down. Well, that began a whole new chapter of our lives. Um, several hours later, we were had completed a CT scan and we were sitting in the hospital in a dark room looking at a monitor, and as the cross-sectional view went down our son's abdomen region, it uh, revealed that he had a grapefruit-sized tumor in his abdomen at two and a half years of age. We were admitted for more tests. They didn't know all the details at that point in time. But I tell the story that like Job and his wife, we sat in the hospital room as one messenger came in after another, the news went from bad to worse to dire. Um, it was cancer. It was stage four high-risk neuroblastoma, one of the deadliest diseases known on the planet. And Alex only had a 10% chance of survival. Needless to say, we were devastated, living every parent's worst nightmare with our two-and-a-half-year-old son clinging to his life. If you've ever watched the St. Jude infomercial, and I watch them from time to time and just ball my head off, you know a little bit about what we went through. <clears throat> with only a 10% chance of survival, it was pretty dire. But I will tell you that God, the God we serve, does not deal in statistics the God we serve, with him, all things are possible. I remember one night when I was praying and I would often wake up just like in a cold sweat, just wake up in the middle of the night, realizing that we were living every parent's worst nightmare. 
and I would somehow stumble down to my office where I would pray and I would find that God was waiting for me there. And the one night that I was praying, the tears were streaming down my t-shirt, hot tears on my t-shirt. I remember just begging and pleading with the Lord, saying, why, Lord, why? Won't you spare my son's life? I can't go on living without him. He's the apple of my eye. I just can't go on without him. Would you spare his life? And I remember when the answer came down from heaven as I was waiting on the Lord, and he spoke to me. He said, Craig, you're begging and pleading with me to spare your son, but I didn't spare my own son for you. That's how much I love you. And it was at that point that I really understood the love of God. The scripture says in Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Later I would receive another verse as I was praying from John chapter 11, verse 4 the story of Lazarus. When Jesus heard this, he said, this illness will not end in death, but it's for God's glory that God's son might be glorified through it. I don't have all the answers as to why, <clears throat> why us, why our son survived, why God chose to spare his life. I do know as we were driving up here, we passed Sunset Memorial Park, there were two neuroblastoma families that we met and we were supporting Christian families that were going through their battle. Um, both of their children are buried <clears throat> in uh, Sunset Memorial Park. So we ask ourselves, why us? I don't have all the answers to the why questions, but I recently found a quote that helps me to understand a little bit more of our story. It says that your ministry is found where you've been broken. Your testimony is found where you've been restored. <clears throat> and that's our story of healing and restoration. In our family, every single member has had a background of brokenness, some sort of trauma. All adoption stories have an element of brokenness as Barb says from Isaiah 61.3, God is making beauty out of ashes. <clears throat> but along with that, each also has a unique testimony of God's rescue, his healing, and his restoration. God is the restorer of our souls. Revelation 21.5 says, Behold, I am making all things new. And 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Though our outward man is wasting away, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. It would be five years later, with Alex finally getting a cancer-free diagnosis, that we'd again begin the adoption process. Feeling as if our family was not yet complete, and maybe, just maybe, we were a little bit bolder, having survived pediatric cancer. So we began the paperwork in 2008, 2009 to adopt through Spirit of Faith Adoptions. After a church friend who had adopted through SOFA referred us, we began the home study and what my wife Barb calls the paper pregnancy process. <laughs> We also began to experience what one author called the roller coaster ride of adoption. After a couple of failed adoptions, I was ready to call it quits, especially after seeing my wife Barb hurt so much through the experience. When an email went out about a potential adoptive placement, asking us if we were willing to let our profile be seen by a potential birth mom, or an, a potential adoption uh, by a birth mom. <clears throat> um, initially, I said no. I, I wasn't open to more hurt, 
but Barb, of course, being the strong woman that she is, said yes, <clears throat> but she was going to leave the decision up to me. So after praying about it, I decided to let God be God and trust him with the decision. And so our profile was picked by ba Maggie's birth mom. And we met with her and her mother, who were navigating the difficult decision to lovingly place their unborn child for adoption. In my experience, these are the true heroes of the adoption story, unselfishly, lovingly, humbly, making a plan to first give life and then entrust it to us as the adoptive parents. I'd like to read to you a note that my wife Barb wrote at the time of Maggie's first birthday. Philippians 1.3 says, I thank my God every time I remember you. As we are preparing to celebrate our precious Maggie's first birthday, I can't help but think about two very special gifts we were given almost one year ago. The first gift we were given was our birth mom. I hope one day that she will come to understand just what a gift she is to us. She made such an unselfish decision, the first being not to terminate the pregnancy and the second to place her precious child in our home. Our birth mom will always be honored, respected, and cherished in our home. The second gift we were given is our precious little girl. She is the joy of our lives. Every one that meets her is taken by her. All of our friends and family know what a special gift she is too. I especially think of our birth mom when I am rocking Maggie back to sleep in the middle of the night. After she had her bottle, <clears throat> I look into my baby girl's face and I pray for her birth mom. If it wasn't for our birth mom's unselfish decision to place her baby in our home, I would not have the privilege of this special moment. After years of infertility, miscarriages, and our biological son being gravely ill, and a couple of failed adoptions, I wasn't sure if our dream to have another child would ever be realized. Then we met our birth mom. She made our dream a reality. Yes, we received two gifts almost a year ago, and we do thank God every time we remember our birth mom. I could go on and on about our adoption story. I didn't even tell you about our foster to adopt story with our three children. But I see we're out of time, so I guess I'll leave the rest of our story for that great and glorious day when we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And because I'm adopted in Christ, I know that I will be received with great joy and that I will be blameless at his appearing, as it says in Jude 24. My prayer is that many of you will be blessed by our story and see God's family reflected in our family story. Thank you for the honor of sharing with you this morning.